Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this discussion on Afghan women's rights during this very critical time as the inter-Afghan talks unfold. My name is Leila Rashid, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce our guest for this session, a highly distinguished and inspirational leader in the feminist movement, Eleanor Smeal. Thank you. Ellie, Ellie's life has been dedicated to the achievement of women's equality and human rights. As an activist, grassroots organizer, lobbyist and political analyst, she has for over four decades been a leader in the efforts for the economic, political and social equality and empowerment of women worldwide. Ellie has played a pivotal role in defining the debate, developing the strategies and charting the direction of modern day women's movement. Ellie is the president and co-founder of the Feminist Majority Foundation and has served as president of the National Organization for Women for three terms. She's a frequent commentator on US television and radio and has given speeches on the concept of feminism, equality and human rights as they pertain to people in and outside of the United States. Ellie is a graduate of Duke University, holds a master's degree from the University of Florida, has received an honorary doctor of law from Duke University, an honorary doctor of science from the University of Florida, an honorary doctor of humane letters from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Ms. Meal, welcome. We are so happy to have you. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a few questions prepared for today's session. Um, so we'll just get straight to it and, um, and feel free to take the discussion in any direction you like. Um, my first question is that... But I just wanted to say one thing. I admire what your, your organization is doing in Canada and, and in Afghanistan for Afghan women. We're, we're I admire that you have a focus worldwide. Thank you so much for being a part of that today. We appreciate it. So uh, as feminists, um, I find that we spend much of our time and energy and focus on the current issues of our time. Right. Um, but I'd like to take a step back for a moment to focus on the long-term perspective. Uh, when you think about your activism over the last decades, what would you say has changed in the movement for gender equality? And, and particularly with how women's rights activists in Western countries like Canada and the US engage with and show solidarity for women in places like Afghanistan. Well, when we first started, and when I first started to be so focused on feminism, uh, we were really focused locally. Uh, and I happened to be at that time in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we were focused on the inequality of women in the United States at the, the local level, at the state level, and then eventually at the, the national level. I mean, we started small. <laughs> and um, we, were, we, we attracted people who were very interested in public affairs and public issues. Um, but I was a local now person and we were suing for equal, uh, for admissions into law schools and medical schools. Women were very small numbers, 3% uh, of the uh, law students, 8% of the medical students in the United States. Um, we, were, we were trying to, to equalize our job opportunities. We, we sued the newspapers for one ads that excluded women. Uh, we, we sued so many things, the police departments, the major corporations, um, uh, Little League, which is a baseball thing that didn't like girls. So it was very local and very national. We didn't have the money to be international. And also the things that we were saying, people thought were radical. I mean, that women should get equal pay was even a radical idea in the late 60s, early 70s. They said that, well, women are just, you know, non-essential workers. Uh, that's been blown away, but, you know, that's where we started. Um, we, there, there was always an interest in international, but we couldn't, we didn't, we really didn't have that possibility. Um, what today is, is a far different movement, is uh, it's very international, very understanding of global uh, affairs, of understanding the patriarchy more realizing it's just not in one little city in, in Pennsylvania or something like that. It's, it's uh, worldwide. And I think the discrimination against women and the abuse of women, we had no idea how extensive 
extensive it was. We, we didn't even know how extensive it was in the United States, let alone the world. You know, I can remember when we took on the issue of what we called then wife beating. And we had no idea the amount of domestic violence. Uh, so it's a different world. We, we have definitely uh, established feminism and women's rights as a major issue in, in our own country. And I think when I say the we now, I'm talking about the, the greater feminist movement in every country of the world. Um, it's, it's a whole different game. But we have a lot to do. We have a lot more than we ever thought when we when people like me started. I had no idea, and I was fairly educated. I still had no idea of the extensive discrimination and ill treatment of women and girls. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, and I find that uh, with the world being so global now and connected in a way that it never was before, it's almost impossible to ignore issues um, around the world if even if they're not local to to you in a personal way. Yeah. Oh, we, we, the other thing I don't think people realize that middle class people, even upper class people, upper middle class people in the United States didn't travel that much abroad. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's a different world. I mean, we're talking on, on uh, I'm on an iPad. I don't know what you're on, a computer maybe. Um, and it was not imaginable. So I do think that it's, thank goodness that we now have a worldview because the problems are not just domestic. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. That's some great insight, thank you. Um, okay, well, we'll move on to our second question. Um, I'd like to turn our attention now to the current Afghan peace process that's ongoing. Um, as we watch the US administration and the way that it's brokering the peace process, some are saying that the, the US administration is abandoning its stated commitment to improving the situation for Afghan women. Um, so what role do you think that the U.S. administration ha or the U.S. in general has in ensuring that women are meaningfully included in the peace process and that Afghan, Afghan women's rights uh, will be protected in the long term? Well, I know one thing for sure. And I've been, you know, I, I didn't want to, in that first question, say that this just happened that put this global focus. For example, we've been involved in the issue of Afghan women ever since um, the Kabul was taken over by the Taliban, which would be around 1996. So it's been a long time. Um, but one thing I've learned, most of the things that I, policies that we advocate, there's a clear distinction between the Democrats and the Republicans uh, in this country. Not so on the international front. In fact, uh, we have much more bipartisan support on this than we have had in any issue I think I've worked on. Um, but, and, and it's still there. It's just that this particular Republican administration is unlike any other. <laughs> and it is, um, it, it's much more isolationist. Uh, but that is not the way the members of Congress feel. That we, we have support from both Republicans and Democrats on this particular issue, more on the Democratic side, but we still have a lot on the Republican side as, as well. Uh, there is a commitment to uh, improving um, improving health care, improving education, uh, democracy, et cetera, worldwide, a commitment to helping people. Um, you wouldn't know it sometimes by the activities. Um, and right now, I'm just really worried about the role the United States has played in uh, the Taliban on United States peace talks, so-called, and with the, and with a very limited, um, I mean, you know, no no real mention of humanitarian women's rights, or um, you know, it's it's it was very focused on American security, uh, which uh, we feel was far too narrow. On the other hand. They keep on saying that they really did want women at the table. I mean, Kalazide uh, uh, has said statements just like that, that they aren't backing off from the democracy or humanitarian um, gains, but it's it's not clear and, and we're worried. And so we've been organizing. We are definitely standing shoulder to shoulder with Afghan women. There's been hearings with all the other things going on 
uh, within the last two weeks in the United States House, uh, in which every, almost every member of that committee, that House committee, uh, spoke in favor of, we've got to stand solid for women's rights, girls' rights, human rights, and democracy. That's right. And, and I think this upcoming election is obviously going to be um, quite uh, a, a, a crucial, a, a crucial turning point crucial. one way or the other uh, in, in how this, uh, this, these negotiations go forward. Uh, but it, it, but it's, it's good to know that there are organization like, organizations like yours and, of course, ours that are um, trying to steer the, um, the outcome in, in hopefully a, a favorable di direction for not just women's rights, but obviously human rights in Afghanistan. Uh, my next couple of questions are somewhat related to each other, so I'll, I'll ask them both from you at the same time and then feel free to answer them how you like. Um, firstly, what can we as concerned citizens uh, in places like Canada and the US do to help ensure women's rights are protected in Afghanistan, both during and after the peace process? Uh, and, and secondly, or the second part of this question is, uh, what is the single most important thing that the international community can do to support Afghanistan uh, during these peace negotiations? Well, we have to keep um, the, the issue as much as we can before the public and the press, and uh, but also before political decision makers. Uh, uh, we, we can't forget the Afghan women and girls and, and, and human rights and democracy. It wouldn't be a lasting peace if we did. I think that the UN uh, and other countries were quite good at the opening of the of the uh, talks. They emphasize, you know, the Canadian um, ambassador, I think, uh, that was representing uh, for the UN, actually, the former Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan representing the UN, mm -hmm. uh, various countries, the, the uh, official representatives at the initial ceremonies spoke about human rights, women's rights, and democracy, uh, very encouragingly. I was obviously appalled that Pompeo, who's the Secretary of State of the United States, did not mention them. On the other hand, um, we know we have a problem and we're working very hard to uh, make sure that that isn't forgotten. And Khalizad has said things, who's the American uh, representative of the State Department in these negotiations has said things and just testified, by the way, in the hearings that I'm speaking of, in which he said that they aren't going to forget uh, women's rights or human rights. It, it isn't, I'm not quoting, you know, per, per se. I'm just saying that there was uh, a different, an attitude that understood that lots at stake. Um, on the other hand, we can take nothing for granted. This election is uh, crucially important in the United States. Right, and so as far as um, well, you know, individuals um, and what we can do, I suppose, to um, to be a part of this this discussion or the part of this, um, uh, I, I don't wanna say these, the, these peace talks because I mean, there's limited amounts of uh, impact that an individual can have directly, but, but as far as um, those of us concerned in, in parts of the world like Canada and the US, um, you know, lobbying um, uh, politicians or talking to the media, you know, is, is there any specific advice that you would give that you think that could be meaningful in that way? I think the more you can keep it before the public, the better. The public is for us, mm -hmm. I think, both in Canada and the United States. And um, I think that's very important. It's very important to keep it before the decision makers and to realize that we have to win this or it will be bad for the world, it will be bad for Afghanistan. Uh, it will be, you know, th this is, we can't turn our backs on progress and, and uh, allow people to, uh, a, a Taliban government to, uh, well, we can't desert really the Afghan government and that has a, a constitution, has a, uh, guarantees in that constitution for basic human rights um, and turn our back on all the progress that's been made in education and in health care. Is it perfect? Of course not. Is it a giant step forward? Yes. In comparison to where we were? Yes. Where they were? Or, um, and I, I'm just so impressed 
with the Afghan woman leadership. I, I'm in awe of them. Um, yeah, I'm in awe of their strength uh, and their, their speaking out at the risk of their own lives. They don't, you know, there's women's organizations in all 34 provinces. Um, there are women who are speaking up in, in government uh, as parliamentarians, 19 parliamentarian, women parliamentarians uh, wrote to Congress to say not to forget equality for women. And for in these recent hearings, in fact, the hearings began with the chair reading the letters from the Afghan parliamentarians, women parliamentarians. So it, 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 it their strength, their their timing, their their um, and their courage, their, their courage to stand up when there, as you know, there's been assassination attempts. One of the of the four women that are sitting on the Afghan delegation in the um, in the peace talks uh, was there was an ass uh, attempt assassination attack and she's still sitting there and speaking up. Um, so I, I just think that in many ways they have a lot to teach us. Uh, yeah, I, I, as I say, I'm in awe of their courage and and their determination, very strong. And I, I think the miracle of the feminist movement really is, is that within all humans, there is a desire to be treated with respect. And, and they, they know when they're being treated unfairly. And then there's these special people who stand up when others would not. And, and Afghanistan has amazing women who are standing strong. And, and uh, Ellie, this is, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, obviously. Um, I'm just as much as you in awe. And this leads us actually perfectly into our final question. Um, and I was going to ask, um, as a prominent leader um, in the women's rights mm -hmm. activist movement, what message do you have for the women of Afghanistan? Keep fighting, keep standing up, uh, and keep excelling the way you are. I mean, it, it's just amazing to me. Uh, the, the, they're excelling in education and healthcare and um, the law in all walks of life. Uh, they're an inspiration. Uh, so, and then we're there, we're, we got your back. We're standing shoulder to shoulder and we're gonna do all we can to make sure our country and the world does not turn their back once more. Um, I think we'll win this. I really do. And I, and I, um, feel that I can't explain it. You know, we always talk about sisterhood, right? And, and, and the commonality of people. Well, here you feel it. You feel that, um, that there's, there's a real spirit. Um, and we, we have to remember that we, everywhere we are, feminists are, we're fighting these established old fashioned ideas that have made women lesser and thereby all human beings lesser. Mm -hmm. We now know a lot that we didn't know then. Um, I think that we have to go forward. We know that there's always gonna be a right wing that pulls us, tries to pull us back. It's not gonna be an even, just straight up hill. It's, there's gonna be the step forwards and then the reactionary part. Of, but I just have a great deal of faith that we're, we're gonna get moving again. Uh, and the peace talks, I mean, one of the things that's so marvelous is we now have statistics and data that shows that when peace movements, if women are left out, whatever the agreement is, it has a short life. If women are at the table and are considered, and women and children are considered in everything, that peace establishment has a greater chance of, of uh, success. And so, and we have all kinds of statistics on it. We, it was intuitive. We thought it was that way, but now we know it's that way. And I think there is a great commitment to feminism worldwide. So I, I, I do hope that we see success and I hope that the United States contributes to it. And you got you're going to notice the feminist movement here will very, work very hard to make sure we move in the right direction. And I, I agree and I echo those words, um, not on behalf of just myself, but also on behalf of Canadian Women for Women. In Afghanistan, um, we are 
absolutely astonished by the courage of Afghan women. And like you said, we stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Yes. I think that it's so marvelous that you have offices there and that you're working on many projects. Uh, we're each doing what we can, but um, it's an investment. I personally think it's the canaries in the mine. You know, what do they call the canaries in the mine? If we would let this slip away, it would be very bad for world peace and uh, very bad for for women there, but worldwide, we all have a stake. Um, and I'm so glad that we have this sisterhood between you and us. Um, and I hope that someday I can go to your conference in person. I hope so as well. Um, well, this, is a, this brings us uh, to the conclusion of our discussion today. Um, Thank you to all of you who are able to join us for today for this important discussion. We hope this incredible session with Ellie has inspired you to advocate in your own capacity for the rights of Afghan women and girls. Um, I'd like to thank you, Ellie, uh, personally and on behalf of Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan for your time today and for your very valuable insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.